We missed having Bible class last Wednesday. We were here singing, and we will resume now our study of the book of Acts, chapter 10. We are looking at the conversion of what man? Chapter 10. Cornelius. And again, he bears the unique feature of being the first Gentile convert, at least as far as the record is concerned. And so in chapter 10, we have invitation from Cornelius for Peter to come visit. And then the vision of Peter uh, basically enlightening him to the fact that now Gentiles are welcome into the kingdom of God. And now we're dealing with that part of the chapter where the gospel is being preached and Cornelius is about to obey along with his household. Tanya, if you will, read for us Acts 10, 34 through 38. Okay, very good. Back up to verse 34. It may seem a bit odd to us the way that is worded. Peter opened his mouth and said. Have you ever said anything without opening your mouth? <laughs> uh, that's used in the Bible actually though to indicate something important is about to be said. Sermon on the Mount begins that way. Jesus opened his mouth and taught the disciples saying. So that began that way. So something important obviously is, is about to be said as Peter is asked the question, why have you invited me? He's been given the answer and now he speaks, of course, by inspiration. King James says, God is no respecter of persons, which means what? He doesn't show partiality. Everybody is, is equal. Doesn't show favoritism as one renders that. Now the word in the original combines the word for face with the word take, to take or to receive. And it refers to receiving or rejecting somebody at face value, at face value, surface qualities only. We say don't judge a book by its cover. And we apply that, of course, not to books, but to people and to situations. We don't take things, God doesn't take things at face value. He sees beneath the face. He looks beneath the surface. And so God does not judge people on the basis of these superficial matters like where you live, how much money you have, and things of that nature. By contrast, though, what about mankind, humankind? Do men and women judge people based on face value? Absolutely. Beauty pageants. Have you ever seen an ugly person physically win a beauty pageant? There might have been somewhere, but I've never heard of such. Uh, the beauty pageant winner is going to be somebody I know they say, well, we're going to look at their abilities and their traits and this and that, but it's going to be somebody beautiful at, at the end. I read an article, The World's Most Admired in 2021. It gave a list of the world's most admired in 2021. And, of course, as you probably can imagine, in the list were presidents, movie stars, singers, and the wealthy. The Lord didn't make the list. It's no surprise. But again, the world's most admired people are judged admirable based on who they are, their status in life, how much money they have, and things of that nature. 
We know that, and we've often been told, lecture by parents, when you buy a car, you better consider more than how the car looks. You better look under the hood. If you buy a house, you better thoroughly inspect that house. It may look great on the outside, but be eaten by termites or whatever on the inside, things you don't see. So uh, look, looking for a mate, you know, so many people look for a spouse or a mate just on outward appearance, never considering, I want to marry somebody who's going to help me get to heaven first and foremost. I want to marry somebody who's going to help me get to heaven versus just what they look like outwardly. Well, God doesn't do that, and we're not to either. We are not to show partiality toward people or bias toward people. The Bible says God looks on the what? He looks on the insides. He looks on the heart and the life of each person. So when it comes to Cornelius and the Gentiles, Peter realizes. Now, now before it had made a difference. You were a Jew, you were a person of status, even in the eyes of God in the Old Testament. But now... That doesn't matter. Now, verse 35, in every nation, not just Judea, not just in Jerusalem, but in every nation. We could up that to not just America, right? But Russia, China, Iran, Iraq, it doesn't matter where you live is the idea. That is not what is important. In fact, one of the ripest nations for conversions today is that of India. And we have a preacher in India who is watching what we're doing here in Verona online. And he sends requests not for money, but for prayers. And he sends pictures. And uh, maybe, Adam, we can share those with the congregation here of people being baptized and all the great work that is going on over there. And so, you know, that's a, that's a wonderful, wonderful thing. And we're, we're thankful for that. It doesn't matter where you live, is what the text says. What does matter is you need to fear God, obviously, in verse 35, and work righteousness. More than just belief, fearing God, respecting God, and working righteousness, living for the Lord, that person is accepted with him. And again, Peter's understanding, this applies beginning now with, with Cornelius. He's understanding that from the vision and now from all this coming together. 36, the word which God sent to the children of Israel. The gospel went to what nation first? To the blank first. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, power of God of salvation, everyone that believeth to the Jew first. The gospel went to the Jew first simply because the Jews ought to have been ready for, for the gospel. They had the Old Testament, they had the prophecies, they had the prophets, they had John the Baptist who came baptizing and preaching about Christ. So they should have been ready. The harvest should have been ripe, the field ripe to harvest while the gospel went to them first. And now the gospel, of course, is coming to the Gentiles, the offer of peace through Christ, who is Lord not just of the Jew, he's Lord of all, including Gentiles. 37, that word I say, you know. I'm going to begin where you know. Peter realizes that his audience knows some things about Christ. And he may know that because they may have talked about that. Remember, he and six of his companions travel back to Cornelius with a soldier from Cornelius and two servants. So on the way, probably they talked about a lot of things, and I'm sure Peter asked them what they knew about the Lord. And obviously they know something about the Lord. Keep in mind where they live is only about 70 miles from Jerusalem, not that far away. Jesus had traveled extensively through Palestine, including this area, and Philip had preached here also. So somehow they have knowledge of Christ. And so Peter says, that's where I want to begin with what you know. That word, I say, you know. It was published, spread throughout all Judea. 
It started in Galilee. Jesus began his earthly work in Galilee after the baptism that John preached. Which John is that, by the way, verse 37? John the, this is John the Baptist or John the Immerser. We call him the forerunner of Christ. He came to pave the trail, if you will, and get people prepared for the Christ to come. And John did baptize, correct? What was the difference in John's baptism and the baptism of the apostles? Both were immersion. We know they both were immersion, but what was the difference in John's baptism and their and our baptism? For the remission of sins. <laughs> right on the tip of your tongue, right? Yeah. Right, right. And John baptized before the church in Christ came. We baptize after. John John's work was preparing people to receive the Lord and obey the Lord. We baptize because the Lord has already come. So there were differences between the two, but both were, were immersion and both were, of course, essential. And then verse 38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth. Remember, there were many Jesuses in that day. And to distinguish one from the other, often the town where they were from was given. So this is not just Jesus. This is the Jesus of Nazareth. And God anointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power. When did God do that? When did God anoint Jesus with the Holy Spirit and power for that matter? When he was born? At his baptism. At Jesus' baptism. Exactly right. And you can turn in your Bibles. We won't take the time to do that. But the Holy Spirit descended like a dove it wasn't a dove it descended like a dove i don't know that it even looked like a dove but the descent looked like a dove and whatever that means it came upon jesus and the word anointed is simply the word uh, messiah the hebrew word for anointed one so god anointed him god made him the messiah notice again peter is preaching jesus that's what the gospel is about he came to the earth, received the Spirit and power from God, and therefore went about doing good things. Also, he taught, but the emphasis here is on what Jesus did. Anybody could have been sent to teach what needed to be taught, but only one could be sent to do what? For mankind. To die, right? Only anybody could be sent to teach, but only one could have been sent to die because Jesus was the perfect, the perfect individual. Only his death would avail. So he went about doing good, healing all who were oppressed by the devil. That doesn't imply that just because somebody was sick, they had the devil. Although in the Bible, some sicknesses were attributed to the work of the devil. This would include, obviously, uh, exorcisms, uh, driving out demons from people that really happened in the first century. And this could also apply to those physically oppressed, or spiritually rather oppressed by the devil and cleansing them of sin. Now, how was Jesus able to do all this? 38. God was with him. God was with him. You may recall there was a fellow who came to Jesus by night and he said, uh, Rabbi or Master, we know that you are from God for no one can do these miracles which you do unless he is from God. Who said that? Nicodemus. Nicodemus. We know you're from God because nobody can do what you're doing unless he's from God. And that's what Peter is saying here about the Lord. The reason Jesus was able to do this, of course, he is God and God was with him. Further, again, Peter is following his outline, much like Acts chapter 2. 
We are witnesses of all things which he did. In other words, we saw it. You've heard about it. Well, we can do you one better. We saw it with our own eyes. When the Bible uses the word witness, it always means an eyewitness. It's not secondhand information they received from somebody else. They saw Jesus do these things with their own eyes firsthand. We saw what Jesus did, and he didn't confine his work just to one little area, not to just Jerusalem, but in the land of the Jews, as well as in Jerusalem. And we saw that. And now that Peter gets to the heart of his message when he says, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. And that's Jesus' death, of course. We know that each nation had their own method of putting people to death. In our country, I think the preferred method in most states is lethal injection now. now it used to be the electric chair. I don't know if some states may still use that. Uh, not too long ago, the firing squad actually was used and may still be used in some, in some states. It's still legal in South Carolina. Still legal in South Carolina. I probably not practice a whole lot, but but it is still legal in certain states. So, you know, each, I'm assuming each state has their, their own right to decide how to uh, execute a, a criminal. Well, the Romans, their, one of their methods of execution, as we know, was the crucifixion. And it served a couple of purposes, obviously. It served to punish the one guilty it also stood as a powerful deterrent for anybody thinking, well, I think I might be a criminal. I mean, if you witness somebody being put to death that way, I think I would change my mind in a hurry if I thought about going into criminal activity. I, I certainly would want, want, not want to die that uh, manner of death. And so it was, it was a deterrent. The only problem was Sometimes innocent people were put to death. Now, so that's, the, that's, the, that's the problem with, with capital punishment, and I, I believe the Bible teaches capital punishment, but one weakness of it is you had best be absolutely 100% sure the person is guilty. In this case, they got it wrong when it came to the Lord. We're glad they did. Of course, this all works into God's plan, but this was innocent, an innocent, perfectly innocent one put to death for mankind, the innocent dying for the guilty. So they, they killed him, they hanged him on a tree. All right, uh, let's see, I think we read through 38, we've read 39, Tanya, 40 through 43. All right, back up to verse 40. The Jews, Romans, we killed the Lord and put him on the cross. And some translations insert the word in verse 40, but. This is what the Jews did or the Romans did or we did. Here's what God did. But God raised him up the third day. Now Jesus was crucified on what day of the week, as we call it? Friday. And he was raised from the dead what day? Sunday. And we pointed this out many times before that the Jews counted part of the day as a day. Whereas we would say a day and a half. Excuse me. They would say, well, in this case, three days. Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Not a full day, but they counted part of the day as a day. So the third, the third day. By his infinite power... And it wasn't a struggle for God to do this. I mean, no sweat, strain at all. He brought his son back from the dead. And not only that, what else did he do, verse 40? 
He made him visible. He showed him openly. Why was that important? Why was it important for Jesus to be seen after his resurrection? Right, this would be proof, wouldn't it? Proof positive that he actually did. I mean, people would say it was just a rumor, it didn't really happen, but there were plenty of people to witness the appearance of Christ. Okay, so verse 41 says, he did not appear to everybody, not to all the people, but to witnesses chosen before of God. Even Peter says, I was one of them, even to us. Some would say that this actually weakens the claim that Jesus came from the dead. If, he'd been, if everybody had seen him, then everybody would have believed. But again, who better to be a witness that this was really Christ than those who really knew him? They really knew who he was. They had nothing to gain but everything to lose by lying if the resurrection were false. Most of these folks lost their lives. They were willing to give their lives because they knew the resurrection was true. The bodily resurrection was true. And so, uh, witness and chosen poor of God, verse 41, even to us, we ate and drank with Christ. Now they did that before he died. But the emphasis here is what? They did this after he came back from the dead. Jesus ate and drank with them after he came back from the dead. Which tells us this was again a bodily resurrection. Jesus had a physical body after he came back from the dead that had needs. The physical body needs drink and nourishment and food. What did Jesus eat? Do you remember what Jesus ate with his disciples after he came back from the dead? French fries and hamburger? Fish? No matter how far they're scattered or what happened to the body. Judge of the living and the dead. 
And again, 43, the prophets foretold of Christ. Remember, Peter is preaching to Gentiles, but these are God-fearers. They would have been familiar with the prophets of the Old Testament. To him give all the prophets witness. Isaiah, Malachi, Micah, Zechariah, that through his name, whoever believes in him shall receive remission of sins. Now, some would misuse this verse to teach what? All you've got to do to be saved is believe because that's all this verse says. Well, if this were the only verse in the Bible that said anything about remission of sins, they would be right. But there are other verses that tell us to repent and be baptized for the remission of sins, Acts 2 and verse 38. So we have to take all the Bible says about what to do to be saved and how to receive remission of sins. Uh, we could say... I, if I were to say to make s'mores, we all know what a s'more is, to make s'mores you need a Hershey bar of chocolate. And you'd agree, right? To make s'mores you need a Hershey chocolate bar. Is that all it takes to make s'mores? Well, of course not. You've got to have other things. I just soon, I like the Hershey chocolate without all the other. I just soon eat the chocolate without all the other. But if you're going to make a s'more, You've got to have all the atoms, but you would agree that it takes a Hershey chocolate bar. It takes faith to be saved, yes, but there are other items the Bible tells us. On our last trip to Disney, it was cool at night, and we saw there where we were staying at the resort there that they had people out there making s'mores for the guests. I thought, I'm going to get my fill of these things. I thought they were free. And, of course, if you've been to Disney, there's nothing, <laughs> absolutely nothing free there. And those weren't free either, not in need of one when I saw the price of those things. But anyway, the point is you've got to take everything. To make a s'more, you've got to take everything to be saved, everything the Bible has to say, not just one verse here or there. Adam, if you'll read the rest of the chapter for us, 44 to 48, we'll wrap this up. While Peter yet spoke these words, the Holy Spirit fell on all those who heard the word. And those of the circumcision who believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Spirit. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, who have received the Holy Spirit as well as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then prayed they him to tarry certain days. Okay, very good. Back to verse 44. Once again, and Peter, I don't know if he gets frustrated sometimes, but almost every sermon he preaches, he gets interrupted. Acts 2, he was preaching along, and all of a sudden, he is interrupted by sinners who cried out, what shall we do? Acts chapter 4, Peter preached after the that lame beggar had been healed, he was interrupted. His sermon was interrupted by men who came to arrest him. And now, in Acts the 10th chapter, his sermon is interrupted by who? Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. <laughs> and these are all good, good interruptions, by the way. Peter, speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell on them who heard the word. This is the most important part of the step of convincing these Jewish Christians to receive Gentiles. God used miraculous powers to get Cornelius ready, that messenger who came to him. God used miraculous powers to get Peter ready, that vision of the sheet coming down with clean and unclean animals. And now God is using miraculous powers to get the church ready for the reception of the Gentiles. So verse 45, they of the circumcision who believed, who's that? Jews. They of the circumcision refers to Jews. These are Jewish Christians. These are the six men who have come with Peter. They were astonished or amazed. Peter is not amazed. 
because he's already been given the vision. He already knows the gospel is for the Gentiles. But these six Jews are astonished. Why are they astonished? That the gift of the Holy Spirit was given to who? Gentiles. If this had happened to Jews, so what? They saw the Holy Spirit coming down on the Gentiles. This was done for their benefit to convince these Jews who are going to be witnesses later that the Gentiles belong in the kingdom of God. That's what this is all about. Cornelius and his household receiving the Holy Spirit. So, it took a miraculous vision to convince Peter. It takes now another miracle from heaven to convince these six that the Gentiles belong in the kingdom. Notice verse 46. They heard them speak. Now, who's the they and who's the them? The they, the Jews, the Jewish Christians, the them, the Gentiles. These Jewish Christians hear the Gentiles speak with tongues or languages. What allowed the Gentiles or gave the Gentiles the ability to speak these languages? The Holy Spirit. Just like in Acts 2, when who received the Holy Spirit and spoke in other languages? The apostles. That's exactly right. Same thing in Acts 2, same thing now in Acts the 10th chapter. Cornelius and his household could not speak these languages. I mean, they'd never studied them before had it not been for them receiving the Holy Spirit. So they received the same gift in Acts 10 the apostles received in Acts chapter 2. They hear them speak with these languages. They're magnifying or exalting God, no doubt thankful for the offer of salvation that God is giving, giving them uh, on this occasion. And then Peter asked the question in verse 47, can anybody forbid water that these should not be baptized? I mean, after all, if God's going to give them the Holy Spirit, who is anybody to say, no, you can't be baptized? And of course, none of them said no. None of them refused to, uh, to accept the Gentiles here into the kingdom of God because of this miraculous power God has given them. We know that some disagree. Some say that God poured out His Spirit on the Gentiles to save them. That the Holy Spirit came and burned their sins away. That's why God sent the Holy Spirit to Cornelius to, and his household to burn his sins away to save them. But in Acts 2, did the Holy Spirit come on the apostles to save them? It came on them so they could speak in other languages. The same, the same here. If the Gentiles were saved by direct operation from God, why send for Peter to start with? with. Peter wasn't necessary. If to save Cornelius, all they needed was the Holy Spirit upon them. Makes no sense, whatever. Others believe, and this would be where most of our uh, friends in the denominational world fall, they say the Holy Spirit came on Cornelius not to save him, but to what? Show he had already been saved. And that would mean that, what about baptism, if that's the case? You don't have to be baptized to be saved because the Holy Spirit comes on Cornelius' family before they're even baptized. And so the Holy Spirit came on Cornelius, they say, to show he's already been saved. Now he's going to be baptized to let others know he's a Christian. They'll say that. But that's why the Holy Spirit has come to show they've already been saved. Our response to that is, now they argue God would never send His Spirit to unsaved people. That's what they say, God would never send the Holy Spirit to unsaved people. But God sent His angel to unsaved people. God sent an angel to Cornelius, did He not? And he was not saved. So why the one 
and, and not the other. Again, those who take this position miss the purpose of, of what the text is saying here. The Spirit was sent not to announce the salvation of Cornelius. It was sent for the Jews to accept the conversion of the Gentiles. Again, if God would pour out His Spirit on the Gentiles, then certainly they're deserving of being saved. The astonishment is that the Spirit came to the Gentiles. Acts 2, Peter said, he quoted Joel who said, God's Spirit will be poured out on all flesh. That Spirit has come to the Jews in Acts 2. Now it's come to the Gentiles in Acts 10, fulfilling that prophecy. And now 48, he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Some believe that Peter allowed these six Jewish Christians to baptize Cornelius, these Gentiles. I think that would have an impact. It would have, it would have on me be, if I were a Jew. The privilege of baptizing a Gentile into the body of Christ. And these six will be valuable to Peter later, of course, as, as we know. Well, did they want Peter just to say goodbye and head back home? As we would say, take off your coat, stay a while, right? They asked him, they begged him to stay certain days. You know, some folks, you wish they'd hurry up and leave, but not, not Peter. They, well, they want to know more about Jesus. They need to be taught more. They need their, their fellowship between Jew and Gentile strengthened. And no doubt Peter stayed there, ate what they ate, may have eaten a pork chop for the first time. Probably liked it. But these barriers between Jew and Gentile are coming down. And Jew and Gentile lived happily ever after in the church after this, correct? Not at all. If that were the case, we would not need Acts 11 and we would not need Acts 15. Because this is the happily ever after is only in fairy tales. It's certainly not in the Jew and Gentile relationship. And Peter is going to be thrown in the fire, so to speak, because he's done this. And he's going to be interrogated because he's done this. And we'll pick there up in, in next week in chapter 11, verse 1, Acts 11, verse 1.